This is the largest gathering of people which has ever taken place on Earth at any time in history. It's the Kumbh Mela, India's biggest religious festival. By tonight, 15 or maybe 20 million people will be here to bathe at the confluence of the sacred rivers Jamna and Ganges. Here in this greatest of all pilgrimage places, the ashes of Gandhi and Nehru, the architects of modern India, were strewn on the waters. And so too Nehru's murdered successors, his daughter Indira, and in 1991 his grandson Rajiv. In India, the currents of sacredness run deep indeed. Among the millions of ordinary Indians from all castes and walks of life are holy men and women who've renounced the material world for a life of austerity and meditation, one of India's oldest callings. Here too are followers of the world's oldest living god, the creator and destroyer, the man-woman, the great yogi, Shiva himself. India was one of the earliest of the great civilizations, and it defined the goals of civilized life very differently from the West. The West raised individualism, materialism, rationality, masculinity as its ideals. India's great tradition insisted on non-violence, renunciation, the inner life, the female as pillars of civilization. And through all the triumphs and disasters of her history, she hung on to that ideal, an eternal quest to identify humanity with the whole of creation a unity in diversity. As our troubled century draws to its close, a deeper understanding of the achievements of other civilizations has become a necessity. As Mark Twain said here a century ago, the Indians may seem poor to we rich Westerners, but in matters of the spirit, it's we who are the paupers and they who are the millionaires. History is full of empires of the sword, but India alone created an empire of the spirit. Our search for India's past begins in an old British library in the heart of Calcutta, once capital of the British Indian Empire. The British colonized India for 200 years, but already that time is beginning to feel like a temporary interruption in the amazing continuities of Indian history. The memorials of that era are fading now with every monsoon rain, and a deeper past is reasserting itself the India before the Europeans. India's history was almost unknown to the outside world till the 18th century. And then here in the Asiatic Society in Calcutta, the Europeans first discovered that India's sacred language, Sanskrit, the root of all the North Indian dialects, was akin to Greek and Latin. The oldest living language, it had entered India in the second millennium BC with Aryan invaders and the earliest and most revered Sanskrit literature comes from that time. Of all the great collection of Sanskrit sacred texts known collectively as the Vedas, the oldest is the Rig Veda. It comprises about a thousand archaic chants and hymns, older even than Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, preserved over an immense period of time by oral transmission. This is the oldest surviving written text of the Rig Veda, and it dates only from the 14th century AD. But the first hymns in this collection could have been composed as early as 2000 BC. The tale they tell seems to be one of the migration of groups of Sanskrit-speaking peoples who called themselves Aryans 
literally the noble ones, a migration into northern India. It suggests that they found there when they arrived a civilization which was already thriving with cities and towns and forts, rich in cattle and treasure, with a dark-skinned population who contrasted with the light-complexioned northerners, the Aryans. The Rig Veda implies a long period of interaction between the two cultures, but it also certainly suggests that in places the Aryans destroyed the towns and cities of the native population, subdued them and carved up their land for settlement. The location of these contacts and battles is made quite clear in the poems. It's that historical battleground extending from the Kabul River in Afghanistan through the Khyber Pass down into what is now Pakistan and into the Punjab. The area called by the Aryans Sapta Sindhava, the seven rivers, the greatest of which was the Indus. beginning, rivers were sacred to Indian culture, literally the source of life. And the first Indian cities grew up on the rich alluvial soil left by the annual flooding of the Indus. In the 1920s, the clues in the Rig Veda led archaeologists here to the burning plain of Sindh in what is now Pakistan to find a hitherto unknown and unsuspected civilization. A forgotten empire which had traded with Babylon and Ur of the Chaldees. During Egypt's Pyramid Age, Mohenjo-Daro had been the biggest city on earth and center of the most widespread civilization. But the language spoken here is still undeciphered. It's the greatest mystery in archaeology, and why the city died is still not known. Yet all over Mohenjo-Daro are clues which point to direct connections between this past and the present day. In the middle of town was a great brick-lined bath, recalling the central importance of ritual bathing in today's India. Here, perhaps, was a priest or guru, eyes narrowed in meditation. On merchant seals were sacred trees and animals still characteristic of India today. And here, surrounded by wild beasts sitting lotus fashion, the ancestor of the great yogi Shiva himself, the oldest god in the world. Those living links with the deep past point our search for India's roots to the village. This is Kasambi on the Jamna River south of Delhi. The village has been the basis of Indian life for thousands of years. Two-thirds of her population of 850 million still live in places like this. And absorbing the invasions of Aryans, Muslims and British, it was the village which preserved the essential values of Indian culture. <laughs> The key to those values is the deep-rooted belief that all life is sacred. In the overfed and secular West, the idea of the sacred cow may be meaningless. But here, for poor people, it pulls loads, gives milk, butter, fuel, manure. And to kill it is literally sacrilege. 
The basic beliefs of Hinduism reinforced this idea of the connectedness of life. At a village shrine, one of the highest priestly caste offers a libation and a Sanskrit prayer. This black stone icon, descended from the phallic stones of Mahenjo-daro, is the mark of the god Shiva, a symbol of the life force. This well is used by the lowest caste, the untouchables, who do the dirtiest jobs. The caste system is an elaborate, graded form of social segregation based on what job you do. But it may have begun with colour, a kind of apartheid, keeping the light-skinned Aryan invaders separate from the conquered, darker-skinned native peoples. In the first millennium BC, the fusion of the Aryan newcomers and the older culture bore fruit in some of the greatest spiritual works of humanity. And amazingly, these ancient poems are still the most popular diet for mass audiences in India today. Especially the Mahabharata. Today's episode is virtually the Indian gospel, the Gita. It is obsession with the senses and the material life, says the divine Krishna, which is the ruin of reason and will destroy humanity itself. India's conscience is perhaps her greatest gift to the world. Around 500 BC, city life revived in the Ganges Valley, and a renaissance took place as glorious as the age of Pericles in Greece. At its center was Benares. For the pilgrims bathing here on the morning of Shiva's festival day, Shivaratri, the city of Shiva is beyond time and history, a place of redemption. pious Hindu hopes to come here once in a lifetime to bathe in Mother Ganges. On the riverbank, pilgrim guides tell of the deeds of Shiva on earth to religious tourists from all over India. As early as the first millennium BC, the Mahabharata visualized India as one motherland united through pilgrimage. And this vast and continuous recirculation of money, people and ideas is what has given India the unity which it never had in politics until the British came. So you've been to Bajnath. Bajnath you have been. These men are typical of the thousands here today. Poor agricultural labourers from a village near Kasambi. 
In the last few days, they've travelled by bus a 2,000-mile round trip, visiting shrines high up into the Himalayas. They've spent their entire savings for the year. We do it, they say simply, because our ancestors did it. The rich are here too. This is the Maharaja of Banaras. He's revered by many as the living representative of Shiva on earth. At the heart of the sacred city is a labyrinth of narrow alleys. In the very center is a small Shiva temple viewed by the pilgrims as the most sacred in India. It's the goal of everyone tonight, bearing their pots of Ganges water. In the inner sanctum, the simple black stone is submerged with offerings of milk and flowers. These ancient rituals connect the worshippers with their deity, but also their history, their myths, and their deepest racial memories. Western civilization saw one god who stood outside his creation. India saw numberless aspects of the same divinity, unity and diversity. Each was a vision deeply rooted in the distinctive character of its own civilization. away from the gaudy tumult of Banaras. In about 500 BC, a young Indian prince preached a sermon which would change the world. His name was Gautam, and we know him as the Buddha. I have reached the conviction, he said, that human suffering must be comprehended. The Buddha's answer to the perennial question was simple and typically Indian. It is attachment to the senses and to material desires, he said, which is the root of all human unhappiness. Get rid of those desires and you'll find the path to salvation. The period of the Buddha's lifetime, from the 6th to the 5th century BC, has been called the Axis Age, because so many of the great thinkers in world history were alive at the same time. The Buddha and Mahavira in India, Pythagoras and the early Greek philosophers, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah, Confucius, Lao Tzu and the Taoists in China, and even some have thought Zoroaster in Persia. It's extraordinary to think that many of those people could actually have met each other. It suggests that the ancient world which had emerged from the first civilizations of Iraq and Egypt, China and India, was undergoing a crisis of spirit, but also a crisis of opportunity. Fundamental questions were being asked about the nature of God, about the meaningfulness of life on earth, and about the basis of the authority for kings and states. And at the heart of that, the question which still plagues governments even today in the United States and the Soviet Union. How do you persuade your citizens to act as moral beings? How do you persuade them to be good? The different ways in which those civilizations attempted to come to terms with these questions still shape them and us today. 
The Near East took the path of monotheism, which would become central to the ideology of the West as well as Islam. China, the Confucian conception of the individual, the family and the state in a perfectible moral order on earth. Whereas in India, the great tradition asserted that this earthly material life is simply illusion and that true enlightenment can only come by forsaking it, the absolute opposite of the Western ideology. And so the social and economic character of these great cultural blocks is still shaped by that revolutionary epoch even today. The Khyber Pass on the northwest frontier, a battleground for millennia. Here the Aryans had entered India, the first great wave of invaders. And in 326 BC, Alexander the Great's armies poured across the Khyber into India, the first great clash between East and West. But only decades later, an Indian Buddhist emperor set up inscriptions here in the Khyber, recording the first attempt to impose a political unity on India. This was the Mauryan Empire, and the Emperor, the Great Ashoka. Little known outside his own country, Ashoka was one of the most remarkable people in world history. His story can be pieced together in his own words from inscriptions on stone columns, like this one at Kasambi, still today an object of veneration for Buddhist pilgrims. It was after a victorious war in which he killed a hundred thousand people that Ashoka became convinced that war was wrong. Then he developed the idea which would echo across the ages right down to Mahatma Gandhi. Ahimsa, non-violence. From now on, he said, I will try to conquer by right conduct alone. And then, all across India, columns like this were set up literally as pillars of morality in order to explain what this doctrine of right conduct, dharma, actually meant. Remarkably, it was not based on religion. It was a secular ideal of the dignity of human beings and the humanistic possibilities of civic morality. And in the clauses on these inscriptions appear all those words which modern politicians find so difficult to pronounce today. Compassion, tolerance, gentleness, truthfulness. The clauses on non-violence abjure meat-eating and preserve a whole range of species from the parrot to the rhinoceros. Forests, Ashoka says with prophetic force, must not be burned uselessly. In all this, and especially the ecology and the conservation measures, Ashoka sounds astonishingly modern to us today, uh, perhaps misleadingly so, as he does in his wide-ranging social and welfare legislation but so too in that bane of our time, massive state intervention with an army of spies and thought police to check up on what people were doing. It sounds intolerable to us today and no doubt it was to some people at the time too. But Ashoka is an extraordinary product of that extraordinary age, the Axis age, turning from the authority of religion and magic to that of reason and morality as a basis for politics. And however imperfectly he tried to execute it, his idea of Dharma, of right conduct, was one of the great ideas of human history, to set beside Greek democracy, the American Bill of Rights, the Communist Manifesto. And as one stands, with the late 20th century world roaring around, one might be forgiven for thinking that this was an idea whose time is almost come. Ashoka's ideals had responded to a deep current in Indian culture. Here in the southwest, Kerala has long been a cosmopolitan place, Chinese fishing nets lining its lagoons.
first century AD, Mediterranean merchants, drawn by its wealth, flocked here on the monsoon winds, as in later times did Vasco da Gama and the Chinese admiral Zheng He. From ports like this, Cochin, Arab traders bore some of India's greatest scientific discoveries to the West, including her most brilliant invention, the mathematical system we all use today. But the real motive for the trade was spice. Here in Cochin, for centuries, foreign merchants bought the famed spices of the Malabar coast, especially pepper and ginger, which are both words from South India. Such contacts help breed an outward-looking and tolerant society, as it still is. Sail up the little rivers and creeks in the Cochin backwaters, and you'll come across communities which embody the Indian idea of civilization as pluralism. Tradition says the Jews came to this village from Iraq in the 6th century BC. Theirs must be one of the oldest and loveliest synagogues in the world. They're only one family now, carefully maintaining the rights as best they can. But recently local girls have converted to marry into the family. So they still hope their traditions will be passed on. The Syrian Christians claim their church was founded by the Apostle Thomas himself. Islam, meanwhile, came by sea in the 7th century with Arab traders, peacefully, not as elsewhere, by war and conquest. So here today in Chandamangalam, Hindu, Christian, Muslim and Jew live side by side. All these people of different faiths, says Krishna in the Gita, whatever form of worship they choose to fulfill their desires, ultimately, their worship comes back to the same source. In the north, the impact of Islam was very different. India is full of riches, wrote the Muslim historian Al-Biruni, entirely beautiful and delightful. And as its people are mainly infidels and idolaters, it is right by order of God for us to conquer them. Within a few decades of the Prophet's death, Islam had swept westwards to Spain, and eastwards to the Indus Valley. Eventually, Muslim attacks shattered the old Hindu kingdoms of the north. Banaras itself fell in 1194, and in the heart of the city, you can still see what results from asserting by force the unique truth of one faith over another. Mosques built out of the ruins of Hindu temples, smashed Hindu walls sticking out of the back 
of a Muslim prayer hall. Religion itself is outraged, said Mahatma Gandhi, when outrage is done in its name. These tragedies initiated a long and tortuous relationship between Hindu and Muslim, which both enriched India and even in our own time has threatened to tear it apart. In Banaras, the Muslims became the mainstay of the city's economy. The thousands of silk weavers, like Suban Ali and his sons, with their tiny shops and hand looms, are all Muslim. It was here in the 15th century that the poor weaver Kabir preached the brotherhood of Hindu and Muslim. But in 1991, a rising tide of Hindu fundamentalism saw their looms smashed, saris burned and livelihoods ruined as India's ideal of unity and diversity went through a new ordeal of fire. A mixed Hindu and Muslim culture arose in the north. And in the 16th century, there was yet another brilliant flowering of Indian civilization, the Mughals. The Mughal Empire created an art and architecture which still defines our popular image of India today in its flamboyant mixture of Hindu, Persian and Muslim. This is Fatapur Sikri, founded in 1569 near Agra by Akbar the Great. Akbar commissioned a great translation of the Mahabharata into Persian, along with these exquisite paintings. He came to understand that the only way to rule India, indeed any civilization, is with tolerance and pluralism, and increasingly he was drawn to the deepest currents in Indian thought. The most fascinating aspect of Akbar's career, and surely the one that's most relevant to us today, was his attempt to find a synthesis of all the religions in his empire. It could only ever have happened, one imagines, in a heady religious climate of India. And it's all the more remarkable because Akbar was brought up a devout Muslim and he was illiterate. His tutors unanimously condemned him as a bad pupil. But impressed by the terrible evils which are unleashed by religious intolerance and perhaps motivated by political considerations. Akbar summoned holy men from the Hindus and the Jains, the Christians and the Jews, the Zoroastrians, even Mandeans from Persia, along with Sunni and Shia Muslims. And out of their discussions, he attempted to formulate a simple belief in God, a, a doctrine of right conduct which strangely echoes Ashoka even though Akbar knew nothing of him and nor, it seems, of Buddhism. Akbar was even prepared to acknowledge the rightness of the case for vegetarianism. Although as a good meat-eating mogul, that was one aspect that he couldn't fulfill in his personal life. One of his friends at court said that Akbar had the one quality which makes a ruler truly great, namely the capacity to meet people of whatever rank or whatever religion with the same eye of favour. His tolerance would be remarkable even today, I think. But in the 16th century, Western Europe, for example, was torn apart by religious wars, with unspeakable cruelties being done to people in the name of God. Akbar's noble ideals were, of course, doomed to failure. But his insight into the Indian predicament was not lost on Pandit Nehru in the 1940s, nor on Mahatma Gandhi, who insisted that all religions are true. Here in Fatipur Sikri, at the Gate of Victory, this great son of a great Muslim dynasty left us this epitaph. Jesus, peace be on him, said this, The world is a bridge, cross it, but build no house upon it. The world endures for but an hour, spend it in devotion, 
the rest is unseen. Akbar's city of dreams was deserted because of lack of water. Today, Fatipur Sikri lies high and dry on its ridge near Agra. His empire had created a unified state, giving the same rights to Muslim and Hindu. An empire of the sword had succumbed to the empire of the spirit. Now it has become clear to me, Akbar wrote, that in our troubled world, so full of contradictions, it cannot be wisdom to assert the unique truth of one faith over another. The wise person makes justice his guide and learns from all. Perhaps in this way, the door may be opened again, whose key has been lost. south of India, a verdant and fecund land of temples, the Tamils escaped the full Muslim impact, and here the ancient Hindu vision of unity survived. In ancient times, the Tamil shore was frequented by Greek and Roman traders. Here, said their poets, beautiful great ships of the Greeks bearing gold came splashing on the white foam to return laden with spices. And in their turn, the Tamils would later spread Hindu culture as far as Java and Cambodia. The Tamils left brilliant legacies in poetry, painting and sculpture. But their finest creations were in bronze. Among their masterpieces is this image of Shiva. The wild god of prehistory is here transformed by the Tamil sensibility into a sinuous and sensuous cowherd with a turban of snakes. This was cast in one piece in 1011, 400 years before Donatello in Florence. There'd been nothing like it since the ancient Greeks. But perhaps the most beautiful of all Tamil bronzes is this portrayal of the dual nature of divinity, male and female, in one body. This is the soft girl, said the Tamil poet, his body the colour of sea coral, and hers the glow of fire, united in their essence. The cultural centre of the Tamils from ancient Greek times was Madurai, the splendid temple with its tall towers, as their poets sang. The city where no temple stands, they thought, was no city, but a mere wilderness. And as if to prove their point, they created some of the most extraordinary religious buildings on the planet. The Tamils exemplify India's search for unity and diversity. They're separate from the north by race and language. Their temples, strongholds of loyalty to their own region and culture and local deities. Even their architecture is a testimony to teeming multiplicity of gods, of imagination itself.
And yet, Tamil culture is united to Mother India through the search for the eternal Dharma, the law of human righteousness, and the universal vision of human existence which the great tradition of India has always sought. The Tamils have also remained loyal to India's primordial maternal roots. The chief deity here in Madurai is the great goddess, the female principle in creation, long supplanted in the West by the male gods of monotheism. And here, perhaps, lies the solution to the unsolved mystery of Mohenjo-Daro and the Indus cities. For it may be that the dark-skinned Tamils are the distant descendants of that civilization. And in their ancient rituals, at however great a distance, there is a still living connection. Once a year, the image of the goddess is taken to the banks of a sacred lake to celebrate her marriage to Shiva. There, she and her consort are serenaded with haunting hymns in Tamil, perhaps the living descendant of the language of the Indus cities. The great goddess, the Indians say, is the cause of all. She is peace, all forms of faith, ever in all things, and pervading all creation. last and perhaps most fateful invasion of India took place. Soon she could be depicted as a naked black female, submissively offering her riches to Britannia. India entered the cataclysmic epoch which has left few native cultures of the world intact. The era of colonialism. The natural resources of India were plundered. Her trees and animals, which Ashoka had protected 2,000 years before, were thoughtlessly consumed. The Indians, bearers of the world's oldest civilization, were treated like children by people who saw themselves as the superior race. fantastical costumes and invented ceremonies, the rulers of a small island 5,000 miles away glorified themselves. How easy it is to forget that there was an India before the British came, which is still there now they've gone. 
And for all the achievements of the British, their most fateful legacy was to open up India irrevocably to a wider world. Our search has brought us back finally to Allahabad and to the family house of the Nehru's. In this room, Indian Democrats met to discuss what India's future path should be. Their hopes and fears have been echoed time and again in our modern world. How far should the Western model be followed? Capitalism, democracy, Western science. How far can indigenous traditions work as the basis of a modern state? Nehru, the first prime minister, thought European models were the way forward and came to believe in a complete break with the ancient past. His friend Mahatma Gandhi, whose bedroom this is, had faith in India's own path, in self-cultivation, in local economies and village democracy, in Ashoka's principle of non-violence. For him, the greatest legacy any civilization has is simply itself. The modern state of India conceived and argued over only half a century ago in this house, in fact, rests on a great tradition extending back thousands of years with an amazing cultural continuity which has reasserted itself time and time again and which brings the ideals of the Buddha and Ashoka and Akbar converging on this house like thought lines. India has been prodigiously gifted and creative in every field of human endeavor. If we were to choose one characteristic legacy, and it would be a Western choice, then perhaps it is that India placed the spiritual quest at the center of life in the way that no other civilization did. But India also had a deep-rooted secular tradition extending back as far as the time of Ashoka. And this tradition deeply impressed Nehru and his friends as they attempted to frame a new constitution for their new secular state. They were also inspired, as we can see from the books on Nehru's shelves, by the egalitarian tradition developed in the West through the revolutions in England and America, in France and Russia although some of those ideals were at odds with the great tradition. And both those great currents went into the modern state of India. Which way the great tradition will go in the 21st century, history cannot tell us. But it's worth recording that in the 1990s, the greatest audiences on television in India still came to watch the Gita, the most ancient and the most authentic tradition of life in India, with its assertion that moral enlightenment is the goal of every citizen in life. And here too, in the Nehru house in Allahabad, a thumbed boyhood copy of the Gita lay at Nehru's bedside from childhood to old age. So perhaps it is still true at the end of the 20th century, true for nations as well as people, that we may know our ends by our beginnings. Outside the Nehru house, the climax of the Kumbh Mela has arrived. The greatest gathering of people ever seen on earth are waiting for dawn, when led by the naked renouncers of this world, they will bathe in the sacred river, in Mother Ganges, the symbol of India's age-long civilization.